Hello, and thank you for joining me again today on the Finding Hope After Loss podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like the show, please leave a review or rating on Apple or Spotify. It only takes a moment and really helps the show reach more loss and infertility families. Next week, I will be bringing back the Business and Organization Spotlight. This is to highlight businesses and organizations that are either created by infertility or loss parents or those that help those who are going through infertility or loss. If you would like more information on this, you can always email me at sarah at journeyforjasmine.com or reach out through any of my social media accounts at Journey for Jasmine. Today, I am talking with Bernice. She founded the national nonprofit Chasing the Rainbows after she lost her daughter to NEC at five and a half weeks old. In this episode, she shares about her experience going through secondary infertility, the miscarriage of one of her twins, and the neonatal loss of her daughter. She also talks about how her organization helps other lost families. Hello, everyone. Today, I am here with Bernice. Bernice, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Like Sarah said, my name is Bernice. I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, where I'm recording from. Yeah, so a little bit about myself. My husband and I met later in life. We got married when I was in my early 30s. He was in his early 40s. And we realized that, you know, we wanted to have kids together. And so we decided to start trying to have children. And, you know, we started dealing with some secondary infertility issues and coming to find out, you know, that I've had issues with PCOS and endometriosis and things like that, that went, you know, undiagnosed for so long where I started getting, you know, corrective surgeries and things like that. And then we ended up getting pregnant and we were pregnant with twins and we miscarried one of the twins early in the pregnancy. And at that time, it was one of those things that the doctor said you either just miscarried or, you know, it was your placenta implanting. It was one of those things that didn't really give us a lot of answers because most of it happened at the house, you know, prior to going to the hospital and everything like that. But I went on to have a healthy pregnancy and we didn't really confirm that it was a miscarriage until after we lost our, our daughter, Brooke, who I'm going to share about. But we went on to have a healthy pregnancy with our daughter Brooke inside of me until it wasn't. And at 27 weeks and five days, I found out that there was no fluid anywhere. Um, and come to find out in two days, you know, we had to do an emergency C-section with her. And she came out completely healthy, was thriving. Everything looked great. She was just early and premature. And when that happened, we came to find out that my placenta was starting to erode from old blood being behind the placenta. And that happens in less than 1% of cases because everybody has old blood behind their placenta. And so why does it cause one person to erode and why not another, you know, is one of those things. And so a lot of questions, you know, we had around that. And then she was thriving in the NICU and a five and a half weeks old. Um, and then we get a call on March 16th at two 30 in the morning saying that her belly got hard and that she was throwing up breast milk. So we go in, they started to innovate her and, and do a couple other things to try to relieve some of the gas in her stomach. And here, six hours later, she died in my arms from neck, which is necrotizing enterocolitis where her bowel started dying off. And when we walked out of the hospital that day, you know, after just all the traumatic events and, you know, the five and a half weeks of being in the NICU and then hoping and praying that you're going home with your, your baby at the end of the journey. And when it didn't happen for us and we walked out of the hospital, you know, with, you know, different items that they gave us in the hospital and things, but we said to each other, like, where's the support? Where's like the daily support services? There's too many people going through miscarriage, infertility, stillbirth, you know, infant loss, like every day, where's everybody? And so that's why we started the organization Chasing the Rainbows then. And that's kind of what led us into our story and and for, for me, it was, you know, trying to find the rainbow after the storm, right? Trying to find what life is like after we've been through all of, you know, all the traumatic losses of secondary infertility, you know, miscarriage, losing, losing Brooke. And so we started Chasing the Rainbows with doing three support groups a day and doing peer mentorships. And then it's taken off where we do trauma therapy now. We do a weekly podcast called Cried Out Loud, and we're doing like yoga, breathwork, meditation videos different things to holistically wrap ourselves around survivors to service them when they need the support and when they're asking for it, because, you know, grief and trauma just don't fit into our schedule, routine, or timelines. So we just want to be available for anybody whenever they need us. So that's, that's my story in a nutshell and what got me to, to meet you, Sarah, and to be on here today. So thank you so much. 
Well, yeah, thank you for for sharing that with us and for coming on. You know, the lost community, you hear it all the time. It's definitely something that none of us ever wanted or expected to be part of. But then, you know, there's so many amazing people there that that use their experience to help other lost families. And that's exactly yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for saying that there. Yeah. And, and you too. And it is true. It's finding like once we went through the experience and realizing that there isn't that daily approach to support in our network, you know, you find those holes. And it's like, okay, how can we have somebody not walk out of the hospital or to not feel that alone and isolated feeling that you and I have felt, you know, at different points in our journeys and things like that. So, right. So how long after your loss did you start the organization? Right. So it was about a year after. No, sorry, I apologize. A year and a half after our loss and that we started the organization and I went through a pregnancy after loss as well. So like I said, we started out in September of 2022, just doing those three support groups a day, the peer mentorship, but then realizing like the other things that we needed, like the trauma therapy, the yoga, breathwork, meditation, you know, the different like also doing coping care packages and self-care packages and those things. And it's because, you know, it. It really is when you're leaving those, the hospital empty armed, they were never so heavy. And so how can we all come together and unite and talk about things that the rest of the society doesn't understand if they haven't been through this, getting us all in a room and getting us to share out loud, process out loud, and just talk about things out loud to one another, because only another lost parent's going to understand what we're going through. But we spread into national. So we started out in Pennsylvania and within three months we hit all 50 states. So that's amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we service everybody across the U S you know, anybody can join our support groups or mentors, our, our therapy, we do it all. So, so I'm guessing then it's all online. It is. It's all online. Yep. All of our information about support services are all there, how they can get set up. And then they just write in through our website and we get them connected to services immediately. And especially for like the therapy aspect of things, it's hard to get in with a therapist. So that's why we have ones that specialize in this area. And also we get you in immediately to be seen. I found too, like when I was looking for a therapist after, well, I've, I went during my pregnancy after loss because yeah, I mean, I'm sure you know how like full of anxiety that experience is. But I had a really yeah. hard time finding one that specialized in grief even, and yeah. especially one that knew about pregnancy loss. That is like really rare. It really is, Sarah. And it took us a while to find those right therapists too, you know, to be able to pair people with and the right organization. And our programs director, Tony Shear, she is a licensed trauma therapist. So she does a great job of searching for, you know, specific individuals that we're looking for, ones that are going to partner, but also, you know, we are asking our therapists because we're the ones paying for it for our survivors. So making sure, you know, that we have a great relationship and that, you know, they're able to support our survivors as they come in and things like that for us. So when you were going through your loss, did you have much support from family and friends? Oh, Sarah. Yeah, I did. I was very grateful for the support of our family. I think it's hard though, when you are going through it, you want to be in a room with others who get what you're going through. And so none of my family experienced, you know, baby loss before my three sisters and they've all, you know, have multiple children and things like that. So when we started going through our journey, I think it was one of those, like our family didn't know what to do, but they just wanted to try to, you know, support it any way they can. I'm grateful for that. But, you know, we were lacking that community. And there was a few people that reached out on social media. I don't know if you found this too, Sarah, but you know, after we posted about our loss and going through everything immediately, you know, some people DM'd us and, you know, reached out and said, Hey, we've been through it too. Like us too, us too, us too. And I'm yeah, like, oh, had that. All together. right. Which then makes you sad that it's like all these people that you just never knew were just going through this like silent. Right. Oh my goodness. Especially, you know, miscarriage and infertility, because they're two journeys that are extremely silent. Cause most of the time you don't know if someone's trying or, you know, if someone wasn't sharing yet that they were pregnant and it's heartbreaking. It really is the, these are the silent losses. I think it's also because you're scared to share because you're not sure what's going to come out of the person's mouth that you're sharing with too. True. I think that, that is true. Right. Self-preservation. Like people are trying to be helpful. Yes. They're just, yes. they're just not. <laughs> You know, it's like great intentions. I always, we talk about this a lot in group too, because, you know, people are coming in and we're like talking about, you know, I can't believe this person said this, or this person said this to me. And it's like, they have the purest intentions and they want to take our pain away from us. 
But in all reality, you're not going to be able to say anything or do anything to take our pain away. Like we have to feel and process in our own time, you know, and, right. and to do it in our own way. And I think that that's something too, you know, our society is trying to get better at is understanding that grief and trauma, there's so many of us that are walking amongst us, you know, that are still like coping and healing and learning how to live again. And it's like, you know, let's, let's be gentler on people, you know, maybe sit there and listen with them instead of saying those insensitive comments, like just being there to embrace them with wherever they're at. I think people highly undervalue the power of just saying, I'm here for you. Let me sit with you. Yes. Yes. It's true. Mostly you just want someone to be on the couch with you or to come watch a movie or take a walk with you. Maybe that'll give me my excuse then to shower, especially in those early days, you know, like to shower, to actually drink something, get ready for the day, you know, but also in my safe space and having someone meet me where I am, you know, and it's, it is all right, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think people just want to fix it and like, you can't fix it. Nothing you say will fix it. And just acknowledging that like, you know what, that really sucks. That, that just really yes. sucks. I'm sorry. Like yeah. not saying like, well, oh, just try again. Like you can have another baby, you know, all that, all, all that crap we've all. Exactly. Oh my gosh. I agree. <laughs> and you know, what's interesting is like, I remember specifically my brother-in-law, my husband's twin brother, him saying to me, because I was like, oh, you know, people, this was right after we lost Brooke. And I, you know, we were still trying to process and just figure out the whirlwind of events that just happened. And they were staying with us for a couple of days and they came in from Florida and we were talking to them about, I feel awful that I'm grieving like this when, you know, people have had this happen or people have had this happen. And they point blank looked at me and said, I can't imagine anything worse than losing a baby or a child. And that was when I started to realize, oh my goodness, how much like society has made us feel crazy for grieving these types of losses, right? And that we should be grateful, you know, that we were even able to get pregnant or should be grateful for, you know, all these other things. But in all reality, we're suffering, we're hurting, we're in pain. This is a normal reaction to grief and trauma. And like, I just need to feel my feels, but I started to actually start to feel validated. This is horrific. This is traumatic. And now realizing, you know, these are looked at as the traumatic losses that they are because they are. And you know, having I those, you're definitely right. Right. And I think a lot of people, they just don't recognize that it is trauma. It is yes. trauma that we go through and it doesn't matter if you're five weeks, if you're 40 weeks, if you lose the baby after they're born, like all of it is traumatic. It is. It is. You know, and we talk about this, you know, with us going through our miscarriage, like when we found out and actually went through the medical records and went through all of that and realized that we did miscarry Brooks twin, that hurt us. Like we, like that was also just like almost piled it on, if that makes sense. Like we were already dealing with Brooke and that whole situation. And then to have confirmation of this, you know, something that we felt like just got brushed under the rug, like just be grateful you're still pregnant with another one kind of situation. Right. And it's, it's, it's really hard when you're there and you're trying to grieve and mourn and just trying to find that community of people that, you know, will be there for you. Well, and I definitely yeah. think you've been through not only like losing a baby, but also, you know, having the twin loss, which is right. a unique kind of grief and, you know, dealing with being in the NICU. So, I mean, that's a whole other, you know, type of grief. It's like, it just kind of all like Ugh. compounds on each other. It does. It really does, Sarah. And so I think that's why it's so important that, you know, we do get together and we talk about our experiences and our birth traumas and, you know, walk through, um, because, you know, when, when you have your baby to take home, you know, from the NICU, from birth trauma, it's interesting because we talk to, you know, survivors of like birth trauma and things that have taken their babies that are living home from the NICU. But that's like, they almost kind of what they've said, you know, is that they forget then about the NICU experience. You kind of forget about the birth trauma because you have your live baby home and they're like healing for you and everything. And then when you don't have your baby come home with you, you do like, you just constantly relive all of those triggers, all of those traumas, especially when you're pregnant after loss and you're carrying your baby and you're reliving your triggers every day. That's why we have support groups for that too, twice a week. And it's like, because pregnancy after loss, you do need to be in a room with people who get it. Yeah, definitely. Pregnancy after loss. Oh, like it's, <laughs> it's, it's horrifying. It's like, oh goodness, it's the yeah. scariest thing ever. I mean, it was like the hardest thing I ever went through, like apart from my loss, you know, like it was just, right. it's like every day you're just afraid that your baby oh. won't come home. <laughs> Yeah. And you talk about it. So matter of fact, at least, you know, I do like I 
like when we were pregnant after loss, I've said to my husband, like, oh, this baby's going to die because all of a sudden I just got COVID or, you know, because of this. And I go straight to this baby is dead. And it's like, I don't have that filter anymore of just like thinking about it, you know, because we actually lived it. We are now that statistic, unfortunately. And I really don't want to be that statistic again. So what can I do with my power and control when I felt so un- out of control in those moments with, you know, Brooke and her twin and things like that. And it's true. It, it's it's so difficult. It really yeah, is. No, I definitely agree with that. I'm as many of us, I'm a person who wants to be in control of everything. And like loss yeah. just shows you like how little you actually have control over your life. And it's like, I just need something to control, please. Yes. Yeah, yes. Give me something. Yeah. yeah. And I think yeah. we, like, like you, I think we jump to the worst conclusion of, well, the baby's gone now. And I, I think it's kind of a way of protecting ourselves almost. Let's just expect the bad news. So when it comes, we won't be so hurt, even though we will still be hurt. <laughs> you know, it's kind know. of a weird dynamic. Yeah. It really is. It really is. And I think too, you know, we share this and, and talk about this all the time too. It's like, I didn't do the photos, the maternity photos. I didn't do the sprinkle. I didn't do any of that stuff with our first rainbow baby because it really did come down to like, I didn't want to jinx anything or I didn't want anything to happen or feel like you know, something happened now that we're like celebrating and happy. It, I don't know. It's like that guilt, shame and blame just stays yeah. with you after you lose your baby. And then, you know, with the pregnancy after loss, because, you know, you're experiencing things that you didn't get to experience in the last pregnancy. And it's so hard. And each baby is different, you know, and understanding that, you know, babies aren't in replacements of they're in additions to and I think remembering that gentleness that you need to on yourself and that grace when you're going through pregnancy after loss, because it is a learning curve and it's, it's yeah. tough. I mean, yeah. yeah, none of us have ever been through it before. We've never been through loss before. We've never been through pregnancy after loss before. So I think we all just kind of do the best we can with what, what we know at the time. That's right. That's right, Sarah. Yeah. Do absolutely. you feel like you had good general support from like the doctors and medical teams? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. And, you know, this is something that, you know, we hope to change and things like that too, is educating, you know, um, some of the doctors and nurses, because (laughs) unfortunately some of them don't know how to handle these situations very well, or they do, and they just compartmentalized, you know, because of going through, you know, having these losses on a daily basis for them and, you know, having to protect themselves. And I get that. But it's interesting because we made our rounds then to another hospital. We couldn't go back into the one where we lost Brooke. And so we did. We interviewed and looked at different hospitals. And the hospital that we ended up at in in Baltimore, Maryland was amazing. And they were one of the world-renowned hospitals. And it's for a reason. And it's like we finally felt seen and heard. And they didn't make me feel crazy for my pregnancy after loss. Like they told me, we're only with you an hour every other week, maybe even though you're high risk. So we don't know what's happening all those other hours of the day. And so we need you just to come in, get checked. Don't feel crazy for doing that. That's what our job is. Like, that's what we're here for. Like we're here for your baby's life, your life. All of that is in our hands. And we only know what you can share with us. And, you know, having a team that was so supportive like that and making you feel like that, you know, making you feel that seen her validation just really is important. I, you know, finding that right team. And so we did, we switched care teams, but for us, it it just made sense because we also wanted to go to a four level NICU, one that could operate if something were to go wrong again. Did they say if you were at risk of it happening again, or was that, did they just say it was like a, it was, it was just one of those like less than 1% things that can happen in pregnancy. And it's, and it's awful. And then also with her death with neck, that's also, they only lumped it into prematurity because she didn't fit any of the other precursors. Cause she only got my breast milk. She didn't have any, like I said, of the other ones. And so besides the prematurity, so that was what was really hard too, because there's no known source for what causes neck. So, you know, sitting with that too is really hard. Yeah. I was also in the less than 1% of thing of like the rare chance of, you know, having something happen in pregnancy. And it's just like, okay, well, all of a sudden 1% seems like a really huge chance. I know. And then once we become those less than 1%, every time like I go into a doctor's appointment or go in anywhere, they're like, well, this is less than 1%. It happens. And I'm like, yeah, that's us. Like, I'm like, well, well that means it's a guarantee. It'll happen to me then. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's not comforting. Just so you know, like I need a hundred percent, like no error kind of situation. I know, and even then it's like, are you sure it's 0%? Because I'm sure my body would find a way to make it happen. Like, you know? I know that is exactly how you feel. And 
Oh my goodness. I think having a team that gets that too, is just so important. Yeah. yeah. And, and that is frustrating that, you know, not all doctors and not all nurses. I mean, and some of it, I think is training. I don't think that all of yes. them necessarily get enough training on it. Some of them, like right. you said, probably try to compartmentalize it, but for whatever reason, like we, we need them to be present for us. Yes, exactly right. So we do, we talk with, you know, hospitals, we talk with their staff, we educate them on, you know, things to do, not to do, what to say, not to say, all of those things immediately after. And we do it from like a therapeutic standpoint, because especially with trauma, you know, these being traumatic losses, we don't want those traumas starting immediately from their medical team. Mm -hmm. Like even the doctor phrasing to you, you know, well, someday you can have another child. Well, in the midst of you losing your baby and being in the hospital, being treated for the, you know, your baby, you just lost. You don't want to hear that. Even though he's taught or she is talking or, or they are talking medically about that. You can, because, you know, you don't need a full hysterectomy. You don't need a hysterectomy. You don't need any work done. Like you can get medically pregnant again. It's not the time to say it. And so that also then makes you feel minimized. And then it just starts the trip ripple effect really in the hospital, because then you have some people who push you off or, you know, yeah, yeah. it is. It's tough. That's true. And and I hadn't really thought about it that way, but yeah, it definitely does start with, with, you know, your experience of the loss itself and you know, how, I guess how others, I don't know how to phrase it, like how others react to it kind of tells you how you are allowed to respond to it. If that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and it's true because if somebody's going to sit there and hold your hand and say like, your feelings are valid, like you are going to be heartbroken, you know, that you're going to be mourning and grieving this child the rest of your life or whatever that looks like for you. But having someone to just sit there, hold your hand and like acknowledge like what you're going through is the worst thing that can is huge and means so much. And it's a couple minutes out of that person's day, you know, to yeah. do that. And it is true. It's like those little moments are the biggest ones in those, in that dire situation. And I don't even think they realize like how impactful, like some of the things they say are, I, I know like right after our last, we were still in the hospital and one of the nurses, you know, she told me that whatever you're feeling right now, it's okay to feel it. There's no yes. wrong way to feel just like feel how you feel. Yes. And like, so that that's always stuck with me that it's okay yes. if I'm mad, it's okay if I'm sad, you know, whatever it is. Yes, it is. It's a normal reaction to your grief and you can't control it. And that's the thing too. You know, that's why it is so important to have safe spaces, especially those first couple months and years, you know, where you have a safe out if you need to leave a restaurant or you have a safe out if you need to leave a party or a baby shower or where you can't go and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And I think honoring yourself and honoring, you know, your baby and everything you've been through is just so important in these situations. Did you find yourself after a loss having things that triggered you, like even things that you didn't expect? Yeah, Sarah, you know, what's interesting is the grocery store, you know, I would never have thought the grocery store because one, now last time I was in there, I was pregnant with Brooke. So the time I finally went back after she passed, I did not realize it. And I think it's also being out in public and the grocery store was like one of the main ones I was going to try to do because that that's in my weekly routine of things normally. And when I went walking in, I like crumbled on the, you know, grocery store floor. And I did that again at a Staples too, when I was working on her memory cards for the funeral and things like that. And there were two places that I did not expect. And then also I did not expect to carry around a cuddle cub and realizing that my arms ached so bad for my daughter and that you know, cause empty arms never felt so heavy and hurt so bad and gosh, they do, they just feel so weighted. So I carried around a cuddle cup in public. And I think that was another thing that I needed to do for the comfort of myself, but also in that it just felt right to do it. And it was that extra comfort that I needed during that time. Yeah. I was gifted a, a weighted bear after loss and that was, I slept with it. I was like, this is like, yes. you know, the best, the best thing. Cause yeah, you're right. right. It's you just leave, like you just leave the yeah. hospital and you have nothing and, it's, but your body feels, you know, you, you are still postpartum. Like you still have milk, you still have all of this. And you're just like, I, I have nothing. Exactly. I have nothing to show for this postpartum body. And what's happening now is what you like when you leave, it's just like, what, like, this is all I'm left with. Mm -hmm. And it's so, you know, it is that gut wrenching feeling. Oh, I know for me personally, me. like I was really angry at my body for a long time after oh, loss. Yeah. Is that something yeah. you went through? Your body? Oh yes. I know. It was like, it wasn't doing the one thing it was supposed to do. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's supposed to get pregnant easily. It's supposed to 
stay pregnant, it's supposed to deliver a baby. It's supposed to, you know, nurse and be fine and do all these things. And then when it doesn't act that way, it's like, you have this immediate, at least for me, hatred towards myself. And I'm like, I don't recognize the person that you are. I feel like I was almost like looking down at myself at one point, looking in the mirror in the bathroom, like, who are you? I don't even recognize you. And I think it speaks to that after losing our babies, we do become completely different people. How don't we after, Mm -hmm. you know, going through the worst thing that a parent can. And it, it really does, you know, take a toll on you and, and, you know, it really does change the person and has you think about everything then like thinking about, you know, what happens after someone dies, because, you know, I want to be wherever my baby is someday. Mm -hmm. It has you questioning your faith. It has you questioning, you know, what are you doing with your life and how do you use your time and how do you purposefully, you know, give your time to somebody now and, you know, only having like for me too. Like, who do I fill my life with and what do I do with it? And it was recognizing that and understanding it instead of being in corporate America, you know, founding Chasing the Rainbows and, you know, repurposing my pain and having volunteers do the same. It just, it means so much when, you know, you have people rally. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with a lot of that. And yeah, you, you definitely have new priorities. (laughs) It's like the. I mean, for me too, like the job that I was at at the time, I'm like, I just don't like this. This isn't important to me anymore. You know, I mean, obviously I still have to work to (laughs) earn a living, but yeah, it's just, it doesn't give you the same like sense of purpose. It doesn't. I know it completely, it does just changes you. So how did you come up with the name? Oh yeah, that's great. Actually we, it was me along with a a whole group that we had of people and doing a study and things like that. But we came up with Chasing the Rainbows because we service infertility, pregnancy loss, infant loss, and pregnancy after loss. So chasing a rainbow could be anything. It's chasing a connection to your baby that was lost. It's it's chasing happiness after, you know, the journeys that we're on. It's chasing a rainbow baby because, you know, rainbows are very symbolic in you know, the lost community and seeing it after a storm and things like that. And so that's how we came up with chasing the rainbows. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's kind of, you know, the purpose of like my rainbow skirt is to find your rainbow as well. And, and recognizing that you said that it doesn't have to be just a rainbow baby, that it can be a lot of other things. It's like finding your, your hope again, your light again, learning to live again. Like, you know, it can mean so many things. It really, it really does. And it symbolizes so much. And it's interesting that we're doing this podcast today on National Rainbow Day. I was just thinking Um, that. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I'm like, oh, this gives us, but it's so true. It's finding whatever your happiness is, whatever your journey is, you know, experiencing these types of losses and what it looks like for you. Now I'm curious since, you know, there's people that like the term rainbow baby and there's people that don't like the term rainbow baby. So are you more on the like it side? I'm, I'm thinking yes, but (laughs) yeah, I, you know, it's interesting that you say that Sarah and I can see both sides of it. (laughs) I am good with it because we do share and talk about, you know, our journey and things like that. Because for me, it's so healing to share with another lost survivor, you know, when they're going through, especially the first days, weeks, months of their loss. So it really is like for me and my story, it just kind of became natural, you know, to share that's the journey that we, we went down but I can see how people don't do. So I know, I think that's um, the most important thing is, you know, especially being in support groups or being with other survivors is you can find and pave your own way with what works best for you. Even if it's what works best for you in that moment or that day. And then next week you decide, you know, you don't want to call Marine, but whatever that looks like, but it's all about your individualized, you know, journey and, and how it, you know, how it fits to you. Yeah, definitely. And I think as long as everybody's, you know, respectful of what uh, everybody else, all the terms and things that everybody else wants to use, I think it's just more of like a a more recognized term to describe. There's not really another alternate term that like everybody knows what that means, you know? Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Unless I guess you say like just pregnancy after loss. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Right. Exactly. So after your loss, how did you know that you were ready to try again? Oh, you know, that is such a loaded question. I know. I think <laughs> I know. it was hard to know. It's interesting how our story went. It was the first time after my husband and I 
finally felt frisky one night after we lost Brooke, you know, four months later, and we ended up first night, you know, getting pregnant. And that never happened for us because we were on that secondary infertility journey for over two years. And, and so it was interesting not having to track or do, you know, progesterone shots or do anything to get pregnant. And and we did. So it was one of those things we looked at it and the, our rainbow baby was also due on Brooke's anniversary day. So yeah, so it was a lot to process. She actually came two days later after That's Brooke's good, anniversary. I think. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. But it was one of those things like I was going through all the first as I was, you know, pregnant with another. And I think it was really hard, but grateful, you know, to be in that situation. But yeah, I definitely needed our medical team, definitely needed a therapist, needed our community too. You know, I was in support group sharing all the time because I needed it as well. But yeah. Yeah, I, I find supporting others like helps me also process like what I'm going through, but it doesn't mean also that we don't need the support too sometimes. <laughs> Agreed. It's a great, yeah, exactly right. Cause we're doing our best too, um, you know, and we're all lost parents, you know, in this community and, and helping. So, you know, I think having that grace with ourselves is so important too. Yeah. Do you talk, I'm not sure if you said how old your daughter was, but do you talk to her about her sibling? Absolutely. Yep. So especially our older son who lived through it, he is now 13. So we honor Brooke, like we do her birthday, we do a balloon release with biodegradable balloons and everything. And then we do a cake for her and we sing to her. And then before every holiday too, we light a candle and we just hold space to for anybody that can share or wants to share or just to realize that we're inviting like in our way like Brooke into the conversation and into the day so that people don't have to feel weird or not bring her up. Cause I'm already thinking about her. We're all thinking right. about her. So let's just like address the elephant in the room and just <laughs> honor her. So if anybody says her name, it's not a big deal. You know, it's a holiday. We wish she was here kind of situation. I love that you do that. Cause yeah, you're right. Like I think some people are afraid to bring him up. I'm like, seriously, I'm already missing her. I realize with every day that she is not here. So right. Right. I'm constantly thinking about this. You saying her name actually would make you feel better and give me some acknowledgement, you know, of her. And it does. It makes me feel so good when someone else brings her up and yeah, says. I feel like when they don't, it feels like everybody else just forgot. And like, you're the only one who remembers. And it's like, that just makes me sad. Like, I, I don't want to be the only one that remembers her. You know? I, know. I know. I want everybody else to, too. And I think, right. It is, it goes back to people wanting to protect you and things like that, but this isn't that type of loss. You know, this is, it's the only, you know, it's interesting with baby loss too. And once becoming a survivor, you know, this is the only time that people will say those insensitive comments, like you can always have another kid or, you know, you can try again later and things like that, but they would never say that during parent loss or during a grandparent Mm -hmm. loss. Like, thank goodness you have another parent or you have another grandparent. No, like you laugh because it sounds so ridiculous. You put it into logic. And then, you know, when people say, you know, about like, well, you have another child, it's like a child doesn't replace another child. Like, so that's like you telling me, you know, if you lost your one child, you'd be okay. And wouldn't miss the one because you have the other. Right. And like, once you put that perspective for someone, they're like, oh my gosh, did I really, that's like, that's what you just said to me. Like, right. you just <laughs> like, think understand. about it, please. <laughs> yeah. And it's really for the fellow lost survivors that are coming after us, you know? Mm-hmm. So someone doesn't say those kind of insensitive comments to them, especially in those first days that you can't, you know, barely understand what just happened. Yeah. Yeah. So we went through infertility first because of PCOS. So I'm just curious, like when you were going through that, did you think, cause I did that, oh, infertility is the hard part. This, once I get past this, like it should be okay. Did you ever have like those kind of thoughts? Oh my gosh, right. I did. I, it was like a sense of relief once we got pregnant and you know, all of those things. And I was like, okay, here we go. We're on like the golden road now. And I always knew loss was possible, especially, you know, with having like loss after loss after loss month after month with infertility. And then to like, always feel like, you know, we're not going to do this, but then that became a reality. Like, you know, I'm not going to do corrective surgeries. I'm not going to do progesterone. I'm not going to do IV, you know, and all those things started to happen. And, you know, it was, it was, um, I thought it was going to be smooth sailing. I did not see anything coming. And they also said, since I had a healthy pregnancy with, you know, an older son at the time, I don't know why they say that, but you know, that this would likely be a healthy pregnancy. Well, also, you know, the pregnant, getting pregnant was a lot different with my son versus the situation after years and years of surgeries and stuff like that, that, you know, put more damage in there. And I feel like, you know, 
people still, I mean, doctors, you know, still say, okay, once you get past the first trimester, you're all good. Should be, oh, be yes. okay. And now we're all like, yeah, no, that is a bunch of crap. <laughs> like, that it's is not true. It is interesting talking to like different medical facilities and different people. They've said to me too, when we were pregnant after loss, you know, once you get past the 28 week mark, cause that's when Brooke was, you know, born, you'll be fine. And I'm like, really? Sure? And, you know, it, was <laughs> like, it did not stop. And it wasn't any better or any worse at that, you know, started the 28. It was just horrible the whole way through in my yeah. opinion. <laughs> I thought um, that too. Like I was like, all right, once I get past the 32 week mark, which is when we lost Jasmine, I was like, I think I'll be yeah. able to breathe then. And then I pass it. I'm like, nope, nope, still can't breathe. <laughs> nope, nope. And then I thought too, like once we have our baby in our arms, okay, then I'll be able to breathe. No. Like I'll feel so much better. <laughs> no, parenting after loss is a whole other ball game too. And sure. I found myself like I already struggled with anxiety, but like the loss and then pregnancy after loss. And then now like worrying about something happening to like my living children. Like I'm just so terrified of something happening to them. Like even worse than before, like every little thing that could go wrong. Like I'm like, well, that's going to happen. It's right. Awful. It's so true. It's hard not to go down those rabbit holes and to think that because we already did live through the worst thing that can happen, you know? Yeah. And so how, like our luck is how I look at it too. Like our luck, like this, this is bound to happen. It does change you as a person, like to your core. Yeah. yeah and I think going back to the, to the whole rare thing, I'm like, you can tell me something's as rare as you want, but now I'm just afraid that that means it's a certainty. So. Exactly. Exactly. Those numbers mean nothing to me. Just so you know, like that gives me. Yeah. I'm like, I wish I didn't think like this. Trust me. Like, I don't want to be like, like I know. crazy full of anxiety. <laughs> It's so true though. And, and the way that, you know, living, you know, prior to Brooke versus, you know, after Brooke and things like that is just like how I kind of look at life now and gauge it. And like, you know, our son would jump off couches, you know, do adventurous stuff. He's a boy. Of course he would yeah. all those things. <laughs> but now it's like watching our two-year-old and her jumping off a couch. It all, all of a sudden takes me to, she's going to fall and break her neck. And like, you know, cause you go to that zero to 180 in 2.5 yeah. seconds. Like I see exactly how this is going to play out to worst case scenario, now likelihood and things like that. It's not, right. but, but it's just like a different way of parenting now. Now it's like, okay, well we have to put like pillows on the floor, like everything, make sure everything's like good. Like it's just different. It is. Yeah. And like with, I have a 19 month old and I'm like, nope, I don't want, I don't want her to have a pillow. I don't want her to have a blanket. Like she can wait till she's way older. My husband's like, exactly. well, it said 18 months online or whatever it said. I'm like, no, 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 no. Can't, no. can't no, you take can't. even the smallest risk. I will. I know. I know. It's the truth. It's exactly what we go through. Going back to your organization. I think first of all, that it's amazing that you have reached all 50 States. And I did it in such a short amount of time. Like, I think that just shows just how much of a need there is for it. Absolutely. And I've been grateful to, to, you know, people who are behind us and supporting us and making this a reality and being able to afford to do therapy for, you know, anyone living in the 50 States, being able to do support groups for, you know, a couple of times a day, like all of those things and really being able to bridge those gaps and, you know, the care for our lost community and really getting them partnered and feeling that love around them right after their losses, you know? Do you have any plans to like expand or add anything else? Or is there anything else that y'all are thinking about? Oh yeah. Yeah. So right now we have our nine services, like I shared about, but we are, we are, it's please stay tuned. So coming in October is hopefully October, November is when we'll be announcing a couple of other support services that we'll be doing. And so, yeah, we're really looking forward to making those announcements and keeping you posted in the lost community. But yes, we are expanding our services based on the needs of what our survivors are telling us. So we're servicing a couple thousand survivors right now. And so based on what, yeah, what they've given us, what they've told us, we're trying to holistically, you know, wrap our arms around them. So some may just want therapy, some may want support groups, some may, but it's, you know, they get to basically sign up for whatever they want or whatever they want to try for their coping tools. With I us. love that you're using their experience and then like, you know, listening to them for like what, what they need, you know, not just here's the things that I think you need. I know here's these nine services we have. You have to be included in all of them. You have to do them for six weeks, you know? Oh, and then there's a cost for them. It's like, no, no, no. Let's, you know, we want to make sure one that, you know, we are not, these are all free services. Everybody is trauma informed, trained or trauma therapy licensed who are involved with organizations. So that's really important to us. And then, you know, having that daily approach and just being there, you know, in those moments that 
you just want to hear from another lost parent, you know? So if people, I know um, you said you're online, if people wanted to find more information, where do they go for that? Yes, Sarah. So they can go to our website, chasingtherainbows.org. And on there, they can fill out a contact us form. Basically just say, you know, I went through a loss. I would love to be connected to services. We then send back a very short, brief email with connecting to each service for them and making sure that they get signed up immediately. And are you on uh, social media at all where they can find you? Yes, we're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and then our podcast is on all major platforms. So, yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story and about your amazing organization. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate you having me on. And thank you so much, listeners. It's meant so much to be here with you today. Thank you so much, Bernice, for sharing your story with us. And thank you so much for everything that you are doing to help so many other lost families. Chasing the Rainbows provides much needed services that so many of us are not able to find when we're going through loss. As I mentioned, it was incredibly hard for me to even find a grief counselor in the first place. Or the ones that I did find, they either didn't take insurance or they would just never even call me back. It was a really frustrating experience And honestly, it's stress that we don't need to deal with on top of the grief that we're already going through. I think it makes many people give up because something as, quote, simple as finding someone to talk to has just become too hard to deal with. And then we miss out on the benefits that we would have received from having somebody to talk to. So all that to say, I'm glad that there are organizations out there like Bernice's that are helping with issues like these. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like the show, please leave a review or rating on Apple or Spotify. It only takes a moment and really helps the show reach more loss and infertility families. Thank you so much for tuning in and remember, we are all in this together.